What's up guys and welcome to today's video. What we're going to do today is go through the process of sighting in a compound bow from A to Z. So if you want to learn how to sight in a compound bow, you must watch this video. All right, man, we're in here. We're at What It Do Archery. That is it. Back in here. See, it's funny because like, I start to kind of show up around July, August. That's right. I, I don't I don't hang around much until it's getting close to deer season. Most I people start, don't. I start busting in. Yeah, that's right. Nobody nobody shows up until it's time to, <laughs> you know, get and with it. When you're trying to start getting your deer stands <laughs> and everything hugs when everybody else is getting their up. bow stuff set up. But but, yeah. uh, but anyway, so in today's video, we're basically going to show you how to sight in a, a compound bow sight. And so uh, what you got mounted on here? Basically what we got is we've got the bow, we've got the Hoyt RX-8. We've already got it tuned, timed, rest set up, everything's ready to go. We just mounted a fuse sight on this. And basically this is just a regular four pin fixed sight. Uh, it's very basic, very easy to learn. And we're gonna go through the process of sighting one of these bows in mainly this side, a fixed pin side. So for, for reference, with, for this four pin side, this is not an adjustable side. This is not, this doesn't have a dial or a slider or anything. So, you know, if you have a one pin side or a three pin side with the bottom pin uh, as a floater, this does not apply. This is just for a, you know, a four pin side. Basically, the first thing we want to do is take a look at the peeps and match the peep up to the sight house. Right, right. That's going to be step one. All right, so obviously, you know, everything's mounted, but before you get out in the field, you want to make sure that you have the right peep sight size because if you don't have the right size, uh, you could be kind of fighting your, your sight in process. So you got three peeps laid out right here. Correct. What, what are these three sizes? These are going to be your most common as far as in the woods hunting. We've got an eighth, a three sixteenths, and a quarter. Uh, I kind of fall right there in the middle with the three sixteenths. That's what I've always shot, basically because it allows enough light in uh, to where I can get enough light in those twilight moments where the bigger bucks are going to be moving. But it keeps my accuracy still intact because the smaller your peep is, the more accurate you're going to be, but you lose light. So the bigger you go, you're gaining light, but losing a little bit of accuracy. So you got to kind of find that happy medium to get where you want. Another reason you want to pay attention to the size of the peep is, at full draw, you want to be able to see this orange circle. Depending on how big your sight housing is, you might have to adjust your peep a little bit. Most of them are common, you know, sizes, but in some of your sites, you can get a smaller or larger site housing. So you want to be able to see this orange circle, and if you're running a big housing in a small, per se, eighth peep, you might not be able to see this ring. And you use that ring as an alignment tool to make sure you're in the same spot every time. When you draw back and get your sight picture through your peep, you want to line it up with this orange circle. So there's a couple of different things that I've explained that we're looking for. One, you want to draw enough light through the peep, but stay accurate. And then you want to make sure your peep's large enough to see the whole site housing. So when you, when you get everything mounted and you get drawn back, do you like to see any daylight around the, the housing or not? That's a personal preference deal. I like to match it up as close as I possibly yeah. can, but you always got to keep in the back of your head. Even if that eighth matches up perfectly, you might not be able to draw enough light through during your low light situations yeah. when big bucks are moving. Because everybody knows this hunted in the mm -hmm. woods, your bigger deer come out right before dark. Yeah. So you want to make sure you can draw enough light. There have been times when I tried an eighth, and I would have to pull my head outside of the peep to be able to see everything I needed to see. Right. So your quarter is big enough if you kind of have trouble with your vision or whatever, it can help out. Uh, a lot of people have done the wrong things and they try to center the actual pin right. in the center of right. that peep right. every time. And you don't do that. You center your peep to the housing and then proceed with your pin. Right, right. So there's, there's obviously a, several different factors that are going to determine what peep site that you need to choose 
whether it be the size of the housing, whether it be the angle of the string, what, you know, the actual mm -hmm. axle length is going to determine the angle of, the, of your string. So if Absolutely. you're shooting a shorter axle to axle bow, your, your string angle is going to be more significant. So that's going to put the peep sight further away from your eyeball. In turn, you may need a, mm -hmm. a bigger, a bigger peep sight. So that's just going to be something that you're going to have to determine, you know, when, based on when you choose what site you're going to use. Um, and when you get everything set up, there could be several different factors to, to choose the correct peep size. So what you're saying is, is you don't shoot the old, the old, the old tube, tube peep No, like no, no. That works great in a certain scenario, but uh, serious deer hunting it in the scenario. Uh, those tubes work great for kids because uh, on most of your kids' bows, the strings are not as good and well built as on your more upper tier hunting bows. So well, you do get a lot of peep <laughs> rotation and that's where well, the tube funny. comes in. It's funny because like when, when, we when I was a kid, like what you're talking about, we used to deal with uh, kids' bows and maybe bows that didn't have the string quality. And like, you know, you might go out hunting one morning, it'd be like 32 degrees mm -hmm. and your peep is turned this way. Oh yeah. And then the next day it might be 75 degrees and yep. your, your string is, has, has basically shrunk or, or gotten longer and your peep's now on the other side. So we used to shoot the old tube, the old tube like you saw in the last video that T-Bone was shooting. Sadie 2.0, that, that tube would always make sure that your peep was aligned. <laughs> Some people were worse, worse, it puts your eye out because <laughs> those things would break back in the day. One, it could put your eye out, and two, once that breaks, you're done because your peep's going to be somewhere you cannot see, I promise you. We don't tend to use those on today's setup. Strings are so well built now that you don't have to worry about that. There's no peep rotation. Most people give you a year warranty on peep rotation. I know First String does, which is what I've used for years and years now, and you don't have to worry about those tube peeps as much as you did in the past. So what, what brand of peep sight is this? I know there's a few different popular options, right. but what, what exact brand of These are just basic aluminum Jim Fletcher uh, peeps. Well, I say Jim Fletcher, Trophy Ridge bought them out few years ago, so Trophy Ridge owns them now. But it's just a standard aluminum peep. You can go with like a G5 right here. The G5 is made of magnesium versus aluminum. So this gives a little bit of lighter feel to your string and you might pick up four feet a second or so by going with the magnesium. So it's just the choice of the hunter. Uh, where they want to be with with speed. If you want a little more speed, you could go with something like this G5 Meta. Uh, like I said, they're made out of magnesium and lighter, so you might pick speed up. This one's made out of aluminum and a little bit heavier, but it's just a solid go-to peak. All right, so we're out here, we're starting in the sight-in process, and uh, obviously when you're sighting in, you know, you're, you're not gonna be dialed in at first. You're gonna have to make some adjustments, so. Uh, a tip that I would say is important is use it as big of a target as possible because like I said when you first start shooting you're going to be kind of all over the place so so uh, using a, as big of a target as possible is definitely helpful. Well first things first now that we're at the range I always like to start out at about 10 yards take one shot just to make sure I'm in the general vicinity and not going to miss the target. Airs today are getting expensive you don't want to waste them. We're yeah. pretty good right there. Left to right looks real good. Need to work on the elevation a little bit, but we know we're going to be on the target at 20 yards, so now I feel pretty confident to back up to that 20 yard mark and still hit the target. 18 and a half. All right, you got 20 right here. Little 20 twin twin. Hey, the pie plate is your friend. Remember that. The pie plate. Pie plate is your friend. You know, is that like a Mr. Miyagi saying yeah. something? <laughs> pie plate is your well, friend. It's funny because everybody else Grasshopper. is like, everybody else is like aiming at this little bitty dot and it's like aim small, miss small. And I'm just like, the pie plate is your yeah. friend. <laughs> Grasshopper. <laughs> All right. That well, is about the size of a pie plate too. So that is. That is. So well anyhow. We know we're on target now somewhat, so we backed up to 20 yards. Rangefinder is a great tool to use in this one. We got the bush nails, they work great. 
Uh, so we're going to take a 20 yard crack. We were a little bit low at 10, which means we're probably going to be a little bit low at 20 as well. But we're going to see what it does at 20 and then we'll make us a little adjustment. It's always good to shoot about a two to three arrow group before you start making adjustments just to make sure you didn't pull the shot or whatever. So we'll shoot a small group and see what we get. Good bit low. Shot number two. All right, we made a couple of shots and both of them were low as we suspected. So what we're gonna do is, this is the tricky part a lot of people don't think about. We are gonna move the whole sight housing to sight in our 20 yard pin, which 20 yards gonna be our top pin. So that's the one we're focusing on. And you only wanna focus on this process with the top pin, whether it be 10, 20, 30, whatever, top pin, when you move it, move the whole sight housing. And what this does is it keeps all your pins in the center of your sight housing. Because say we were low and I just started moving my pin low, I'm gonna bunch all my pins up in the bottom of this housing and it could block my sight picture. As well, if we were hitting, let's just say high, and we had to move the pin upward, it might put your pin at the whole, all the way at the top of the site housing. So we're trying to eliminate that and keep all our pins in the center of the site housing. And that's why we're gonna do it this way. So 20 yards is gonna be my top pin and I'm about to adjust it now. So we talked about, we're gonna adjust the whole housing, not just the individual pin. So what we do on this process is we'll loosen this bolt and we are low, so I'm gonna bring it down. You always wanna chase the arrow. If you're shooting low, move the sight low. So I'm gonna loosen this bolt. I'm gonna move the sight down a little bit. And you, you're making pretty small adjustments at, you know, at a time. You don't wanna make- Correct. You don't wanna move it too far. Yep. Little goes a long ways. Yes. This is all trial by error. There's no set mathematical formula that's gonna dial it in right the first time. You're just kind of moving it a little bit at a time and walking it in there. So we were shooting low, we moved the sight low. So I've moved the sight housing down now. We're gonna check and see where we're at now. And there's no set standard at where you set your pins. Uh, for younger or youth shooters, you might want to do a 10, 15, and a 20 yard. But most of your adults are going to want a 20, 30, 40, 50, and so on. I do know some people that like to do it 25, 35, 45. Personal preference, 100%. But the only one you want to adjust the whole housing on will be your top pin. Oh yeah. All right, Brian referred to earlier the pie plate. I'll say that's in the pie plate. Yeah. You're a pie plate official. <laughs> you want to choose another one or you? Oh, we can't. That looks good. Looks pretty sharp. 30 yards. What I like to do before I take a shot at a new distance. I like to kind of go ahead and put my pin where I think it should be. Uh, when you buy the sight, there's no telling what the separation, usually they run them very close together when you buy it. So you got to kind of spread them out a little bit. So I always like to guess a little bit about where my drop's going to be. So I'm on, this bow's shooting pretty fast. The faster your bow, of course, the less your gap is gonna be in between your pins. So 20 to 30 yards is usually a lesser gap than say 30 to 40 yards. Let's give this a shot. Pretty good. Okay, we're pretty close. We're a little bit low, but I'm gonna take another shot. 
Left to rights are looking real good. Okay, we got a good group right there, but we're a little bit low. We're consistently low, and that's what we want to know. So basically, I'm going to do the same thing I did with the 20. I'm going to move my pin a little bit lower, but I'm not going to move the whole housing this time. I'm just going to move the individual pin. This is what everybody needs for they start dealing with archery. It's a little Allen wrench pack. So now I'm going to find the individual pin. Something that I think you want to take into consideration is when you're sighting your bow in, don't be afraid to, if you get tired, to give yourself a rest, come back the next day. Make sure you give yourself enough time, to, you know, before the season starts to execute good shots because what you don't want to do is start spraying all over the target when you're really tired and you get really shaky. Um, you'll just you'll just fight it all over the place. So make sure, you know, you, you take plenty of rest time in between your groups and uh, it'll help you get sighted in a lot more precise. There we go. We have got a correction made. Now it looks like we're fairly on target. The veins kicked a little high, so it looks a little bit better than you can see from here. But it looks like it's in the bullseye. Again, we're gonna take one more shot for consistency. All right, we're looking pretty good. That one hit very close to the other one, so we know we're consistent right there in the pie plate we talked about. So we're good to go at 30 now. This is moving along pretty quick. Okay, where we're at right now is 40 yards. We've moved along pretty quickly, dialed in the 20 and the 30. We're moving to 40 right now. Right now is about where a lot of your bow hunters are gonna stop as far as live scenario in the woods. Most people limit themselves to about 40 yards and in. So this is where we're gonna stop today is at 40 yards. Some people feel a little bit comfortable and might go to 50, but around here in the southeast in Georgia, you don't get a whole lot of shot opportunities past 40 anyhow. So 40 is a good place to stop. As long as you've got a 20, 30, and a 40, you should be able to hunt anything, anywhere, anytime. What I'm looking at now is the pin gap's probably a little bit too big between 30 and 40. So I'm going to adjust to where I think it might be, and I'm going to move that 40-yard pin up just a hair to try to get as close as possible. There we go. All right. That looks pretty good, so we're going to give it a try and see where we end up. right yeah Maybe. looks like a little bit high right let's take another shot just to see I noticed on that 30 it was drift started drifting a little bit right and that's another point I want to make the further back you get you might have to start adjusting your left and rights a little bit because at 20 yards it doesn't have the time to move very far but when you back up to 40 yards you've got a lot more time for it to drift so we're starting to see that arrow walk out a little bit so after we get this, as far as elevation done, we might work on windage a little bit too and get our left to rights. Yeah, it looks like it's walking right just a little bit. Uh, height is looking somewhat okay, but I'm starting to walk right. So I think my pin gap is good as far as high and low, but now we're coming into a right or left issue. So I'm shooting towards the right. My arrows are hitting to the right. So I'm gonna move my sight to the right and it'll correct itself. Not too much, just a little bit. Now, that should correct my right issue. So all of your left to rights will be moving the whole sight housing itself. There we go. That's looking a little bit better. It's a little bit left, but that might have been me. Maybe both kind of in the same spot. 
I'm a little bit high left right now, so we're gonna fine tune it just a little bit more. The further back you get, you know, you've got to be so much more steadier, so much more relaxed, and the more you shoot, the more fatigued you get, the more you're gonna start missing your points of impact. So Brian made a good point by saying, once you get tired, you need to stop. Because when you're not at your top of game and you're not accurate, you'll start adjusting your sights when you don't really need to. So once you get tired, stop. We were a little high. So we're going to come a little bit. These things are kind of tough to move. Right there feels pretty good. And we were a little bit left. Just barely two inches high left. Two inches high left. I'm going to move. Again, we're doing left. So the only way I can do my left and rights is to move the whole site housing, which is going to be this one right here. That's got to be solid right there. Oh, yeah. Perfect right nice. there. And that's what we're looking for. We're going to take one more shot for consistency. See what we get. There we go. Hey, what we're gonna do is go over a couple of simple form tips. A lot of this stuff's gonna feel awkward when you first start trying to apply it to your shooting skills. But a lot of people, when they grab a bow, they wanna grab it like a baseball bat and, and really put some grip on it. And what that's doing is torquing your bow to the left or the right. So we want a grip that's gonna eliminate as much torque as possible. So we want to get out of this baseball solid grip like that. One thing that does is it puts the grip down the center of your hand right there in that valley and makes it more susceptible to torque in the left and right fashion. So we want to eliminate all that. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to run it right across the fatty part of our thumb right here. Another thing people do is they do a real high throat grip. What I mean by that is applying a lot of pressure up there at that point. We want to eliminate that and evenly distribute pressure down the grip. So the way we're going to accomplish all this we just talked about is we're going to rock our knuckles out at about a 45 degree angle. And instead of that high throat grip, how we're going to eliminate that is Instead of doing this, we want to tell somebody to stop and do it like this right here. What we're going to look like right now, 45 degree angle with the pressure evenly distributed down the grip. And you'll see it kind of looks like I'm telling somebody to stop. That's the way you want it with your knuckles at a 45 degree angle. Fatty part of your hand, stop. Fatty stop. <laughs> Tip number two coincides with a little bit of what we talked about earlier, being in the correct draw length. When you draw the bow back, you want the string to cross at the corner of your mouth and the tip of your nose to be right on top of the string. So corner of your mouth, tip of your nose, sight picture through the peak. Another thing you want to make sure of is you, that you don't dig in too deep with your kisser or apply too much pressure with your nose. If you do that, like I'm doing right there, it can really affect the shot. You just want it barely touching. You want the kisser barely touching the corner of your mouth and the tip of your nose barely touching the string. Just like that. All right, guys, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight as to how to sight in a compound bow. Like I said, this process is for a three, four, five, some people even use six or seven pin, uh, fixed pin sights. The process for a movable sight is completely different. So if there's anything else you want to see from us, drop a comment below. Well, we'd love to hear your feedback. Love to hear, uh, you know, what setups work for you. And uh, so, yeah, see you guys in the next video.